My name is Rakesh Sood. I was an Indian diplomat for 38 years. And during that time, I also served as ambassador of India to Afghanistan. Today, I want to talk about the old linkages between India and Afghanistan, or actually, shall I say, the Indian subcontinent in Afghanistan. And where Afghanistan is today and the multiple transitions that it has had at a political level. Actually, my first glimpse of Afghanistan came in 1990. At that time, I was posted in Pakistan. I got permission from the Pakistan government to drive up to the Khyber Pass. We crossed the Indus River at Atak, went to Peshawar. I spent some time roaming around in the Kissa Khwani Bazaar, the bazaar of the storytellers. And then from there came up to Landi Kotal, broke for some sandwiches and tea at the Khyber Rifles Regimental Mess and then came up to the Khyber Pass. Little did I know that years later, one day, I would be standing at the same Khyber Pass, this time from the Afghan side, looking into Pakistan. Standing there, I could sense the passage of history of the countless conquerors and soldiers, the pilgrims and traders who had walked over these paths. The linkages between the land of the Hindu Kush and the Indian subcontinent can be traced back in an unbroken chain to the Aryans. The Rig Veda refers to the Kuba River, believed to be the Kabul River and Bakhdi, a reference to Balkh. The people here had already come under the influence of Zoroastrianism. The name Bactria became more prevalent after Alexander of Macedon swept through the region, proceeding through the famed Khyber Pass into the valley of Swat and then onward into the plains of Punjab. From Seleucus, who stayed behind to manage the lands, they became part of the Mauryan Empire. Bilingual rock inscriptions in Greek and Aramaic of Ashokan edicts have been excavated in Kandahar and Lagman. With the beginning of the Christian era, the Kushans came to control the territory. Emperor Kanishk's domain stretched from Varanasi in the east to across the plains of Punjab and covered most of Afghanistan. His summer capital was Kapisa, a name better known today as Bagram, the military base that the Americans just vacated. While Emperor Kanishka's winter capital was Peshawar, it was the time of the Caesars in Rome and the Han Empire in China. The Silk Route came into being. Indian ivories and bronzes, Chinese silks and lacquerware, Alexandrian perfumes and glassware became the internationally traded commodities. It is during the Kushan period that Buddhism made its way northwards into Tibet and China. Gandharan art flourished and reflects the strong Buddhist influences. By the 3rd century AD, Bamiyan became a major camping site for the caravans that traversed the Silk Route. The world's largest statues of Buddha carved into rock standing at 38 meters 
and 55 meters attracted pilgrims and monks. Fahian, a Chinese pilgrim passing through Bamiyan around 400 AD wrote about the ceremonies conducted by more than a thousand monks who lived and meditated in the honeycomb of the rock face, as did Huan Sang, who followed him more than 200 years later. Hui Chao, a Korean monk who passed through in 827 AD, chronicled the wealth and grace of the Buddhist king of Bamiyan. These statues marked the heritage of over 1,500 years when they were destroyed by the Taliban in March 2001, six months before the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center that led to the US intervention. But I'm getting ahead of my story. With the decline of the Kushans, and as Persia fell under the sway of Islam, came the Turkics and the Arabs. It was followed by the period of the Ghaznavids. Remember the raids conducted by the Mahmud of Ghazni? Followed by the Ghoris. The prosperity of the lands attracted Shanghai's Khan, who pillaged and massacred his way from Balkh to Herat, Ghazni and Bamiyan. In the early 16th century came the Uzbeks. The famous one we know was Zahiruddin, later known as Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire. He originally came to Kabul, retreating from his cousins, and after repeatedly failing to gain control back of Samarkand, turned his attention eastwards. However, he always retained a great affection for the gardens of Kabul and his chronicle Babar Nama records the descriptions of the flora and fauna of the region. According to his wishes, his Afghan wife Bibi Yusufzai brought his remains back in 1539, nine years after his death where he now rests at Bhage Babur. Incidentally, Bhage Babur was destroyed during the civil war that engulfed Afghanistan in the early 1990s and then restored painstakingly by Ratish Nanda, a renowned Indian restoration architect over a five-year period. He is better known in India as the architect responsible for the restoration of Humayun's tomb. It is worth noting that both projects were funded by the Aga Khan Trust. By the 18th century, the Mughal Empire was in decline. A Turkmen general, Nadir Shah, had taken over Afghanistan and had mounted raids into India. During one of these, he also acquired the Kohinoor, among other treasures. Returning from his campaign, in 1747, he was assassinated near Kandahar. The local chiefs held a Loya Jirga, a meeting of the elders, and chose a young Saddozai chieftain as the new king, Ahmad Shah Abdali, or Durrani as he renamed himself. He consolidated the territory, that is today Afghanistan, and is widely described as the father of Afghanistan. His successors soon moved the capital to Kabul. By the time the third generation came in, the Saddozai Silsila was beset by infighting. The other tribal chiefs, the Muhammadzais, were eyeing the throne. In India, Maharaja Ranjit Singh ruled from Punjab to beyond Peshawar and the East India Company was getting worried as Tsarist Russia expanded eastwards. The stage was set for the great game. Incidentally, the term was used first by Sir Arthur Connolly, an intelligence officer and explorer in service with the East India Company in the 1840s. 
but was then immortalized by Rudyard Kipling in Kim, published in 1901. In order to secure their empire, the British were seeking to establish trading routes to Bukhara and Khiva that required a pliant regime in Kabul and a well-disposed Persian and Ottoman empires. The Saddozai Air Shah Shuja, unable to defend Kabul, took refuge in Lahore at the court of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. This is how the Kohinoor came into his possession in 1813. It was then passed on by an 11-year-old Maharaja Dulip Singh to the British when they acquired Punjab in 1849. The British began to get nervous about the presence of visiting Russian envoys in the court of Amir Dost Muhammad in Kabul and after a military campaign succeeded in restoring Shah Shuja to his throne with Sir Alexander Burns as the political agent. Shah Shuja proved to be an unpopular ruler and two years later the people revolted, egged on by Dost Muhammad's son Wazir Akbar Khan. Burns was killed as was every single member of the retreating 16,000 strong British contingent except one. An assistant surgeon by the name of Dr. William Bryden who was spared so that he could convey the news to the British garrison at Jalalabad. Eight months later, the British army returned to exact revenge. The first Anglo-Afghan war came to an end, but the British also realized that their intervention hadn't worked and Amir Dost Muhammad was reinstated in 1843. However, the great game continued. A second Anglo-Afghan war took place in 1879. Another British political agent, Sir Louis Cavanari, entered Kabul only to be brutally killed three months later. This is when British India decided to draw up territorial boundaries in Afghanistan or around Afghanistan. The Pamir Boundary Commission between Russia and Afghanistan drew the boundary along the Oxus River and the Wakhan Corridor in the east was created as a buffer between the imperial powers. The Durand Line was demarcated in 1893 and settled the boundary between British India and Afghanistan. Incidentally, the Afghans never accepted it because it passed through the Pashtun homelands so much so then that when India and Pakistan emerged as independent countries in 1947, there was one country that voted against Pakistan's admission to the United Nations by virtue of the fact that it did not have settled borders. That country was Afghanistan. The aftermath of World War I and the Russian Revolution of 1917 created the environment for a third Anglo-Afghan war in 1920-21, finally bringing an end to the British gate game. Afghanistan gained full independence. After another decade of turbulence, the Muhammad Zai monarchy returned. Zahir Shah became the king in 1933, continuing for four decades, navigating the complicated politics of World War II slowly modernizing his country and imparting a degree of stability that had eluded Afghanistan for nearly a hundred years. This ended abruptly with the coup in 1973, setting into motion a chain of events that is still unfolding. King Zahir Shah's cousin and brother-in-law, Sardar Muhammad Daoud, took over and abolished the monarchy. He sought to balance competing forces. He was backed by the Communist Party in Afghanistan known as the PDPA, 
People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, and which was in turn backed by USSR, or Soviet Union. But Mohammad Daoud sought to balance his dependence on Soviet Union by also opening up channels towards the US. Five years later, he was deposed by a faction of the PDPA by Noor Muhammad Taraki in April of 1978. He was killed along with his family in Gulkhana, part of the palace complex of Kabul. There was a growing presence of the Soviet experts and KGB officers in Afghanistan. In February 1979, there was the abduction and killing of the US ambassador in Kabul, Adolf Dubs. Months later, Noor Muhammad Taraki was deposed in a coup by his deputy premier, Hafizullah Amin. Taraki was killed also in the palace complex at the Kuteh Bagcha, not far from where he had supervised the killing of Sardar Muhammad Daud and his family. Hafizullah Amin's tenure lasted barely five months. The Soviet military intervention took place on 27th of December 1979. Hafizullah Amin was killed at another palace, Darul Aman Palace, by the Soviet special forces, the Spetsnaz. Soviet Union installed Babrak Karmal, replacing him with Najibullah in 1986. A new great game had begun, this time labeled the Cold War, and Afghanistan was at its center. It had a lasting impact, not just on Afghanistan, but the whole region. And the region is still trying to cope with the furies that were unleashed. Looking back, geography is a key factor for determining Afghanistan's fate. Historically speaking, Afghanistan has been a mosaic of different ethnicities. Today, about 45% of the Afghan population is Pashtun. Although the Pashtun heartland was divided into two in 1893 by the Durand Line. In addition, there are about 27% Tajiks, about 10% Uzbeks, perhaps an equal number of Hazaras, and then there are other smaller groups, Turkmens, IMEX, and so on. These groups have normally existed in different parts of what is today Afghanistan. The geography is also determined by the Hindu Kush mountains that come down from the Pamirs about halfway down, ending in what are the deserts the Baluch, Baluchistan deserts on the Pakistani side and the Sistan Baluchistan desert on the Iranian side and the deserts in Nimroz and in the south of Helman. So the eastern part of Afghanistan has largely been Pashtun dominated. The northern part has had Tajiks and Uzbeks and others, while the central highlands are the Hazaras, who are also Shias. These groups, especially the non-Pashtuns, are all Farsi-speaking or Dari-speaking. And they also have stronger linkages with the Central Asian countries. All this has meant that through a large part of the 19th century, Afghanistan was a borderland, a periphery. 
It was never fully assimilated, but it was never fully autonomous. Remember, the British always wanted to have a political agent to be able to advise and guide Afghanistan King regarding the foreign and security policies and to act as the eyes and ears for the East India Company and following that, the British Indian forces. It was a frontier of separation. First, in the 19th century between the British, Persian, Russian and Turkic empires. And then, in the 20th century, it became the stage for the final showdown in the Cold War. Therefore, since 1747, a stable Afghan-centric rule only existed during the five decades of the Saddozai rule, starting with Ahmad Shah Durrani, and the four decades under King Zahir Shah. These short periods did not enable the development of modern state institutions. The tribal character based on segmentary lineages or the segmentary lineage system of kinship rather than hierarchy continued. In such a system, decision making was often collective and consensual, relying on elders and other spiritual leaders. Hence the importance even today of the Loya Jirga. Such societies are often described by anthropologists and sociologists as acephalous societies. Conflicts last for generations till they are settled through blood money or through giving or taking of a bride. A key reason is that the Pashtun tribes have followed these customs and practices and as they account for 45% of the population, they have also ruled Afghanistan for the last 250 years. But let us return to 1979. The Soviet intervention lasted a decade. US wanted it to be a quagmire, a Soviet Vietnam. Zbigniew Brzezinski, national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter, made it clear in an interview in 1998 the idea was to draw Russians into the Afghan trap. He acknowledged that CIA had started funding Afghan Muslim dissidents even before the Soviets intervened in 1979. Asked whether it had been worth it in view of the growth of militant Islam, he said, what is more important to the history of the world, the Taliban? or the collapse of the Soviet Union, liberation of Central Europe, and the end of the Cold War. In the end, the cost to the USSR was nearly $75 billion. 15,000 Soviet soldiers died. The US tab for the CIA-sponsored covert war, no casualty, and $5 billion, an equivalent amount was also given by the Saudis. The real price was paid by the Afghans. A million dead and over five million became refugees. Uh, an entire generation was lost. The region too paid a price. There was the radicalization of Pakistan. Madrasas mushroomed. Today, it is estimated that there are something like 36,000 madrasas in Pakistan. There was the emergence of extremist groups in Central Asia and in China and Xinjiang. Kashmir went on the boil in the 1990s. New terms entered the political vocabulary, non-state actors state-sponsored terrorism and the like. 
Following the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, the US lost interest. The Berlin Wall had come down later that year and two years later, the Soviet Union broke up. Jihad against the godless communist became jihad against the infidel. It was now a weapon of war. To everybody's surprise, Najibullah lasted another three years. Eventually, the Pakistani-sponsored Mujahideen got their act together and took over Kabul in 1992. Najibullah took refuge in the UN compound. Within a year, the Mujahideen infighting began. Communists had been defeated. Now, the ethnic divisions resurfaced. Much to their frustration, the Pakistani ISI was unable to get their protégés, the Mujahideen leaders, to listen to them. Warlords with their militias began to call the shots. As the country sank into civil war, Pakistan introduced a new act. Drawn from the madrasas, generously funded by the oil-rich Gulf states and charities, there now emerged a younger lot of Afghan Pashtuns who had grown up in the refugee camps, the Taliban. Beginning in Kandahar in 1994, the Taliban imposed the Sharia and a rough and ready justice. Slowly, they continued their advance and in 1996, had taken over Kabul. Najibullah was dragged out of the UN compound, killed, and his dead body strung from a lamppost. Other ethnic groups, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and the Hazaras are also Shias, gravitated together to form the Northern Alliance under the charismatic Ahmad Shah Massoud. US remained preoccupied with managing the unification of Germany, the eastward expansion of the European Union and of NATO. Support for the Northern Alliance came from Russia, Iran and India. Once again, Afghanistan was a borderland. Massoud was assassinated by a suicide squad that had come disguised as a TV crew two days before 9-11. Taliban were now within reach of cementing their hold over all of Afghanistan. But then came 9-11 and the US returned to Afghanistan and the Taliban dreams evaporated, at least then. 20 years later, the Americans seem to have had enough. The war effort has cost the US $2 trillion and counting, $980 billion for the military operations, over 2,400 US soldiers dead, and another 1,144 Allied troops dead along with 3,800 private military contractors. Another 143 billion has been spent on reconstruction. Out of this, about 90 billion went for the Afghan army, police, and the other security forces. 36 billion went for governance and economic development activities. The rest of the world contributed an equivalent amount, and the balance went on counter-narcotics and humanitarian relief works. Add to it another $500 million on account of interest payments on borrowings, and another $300 million on veterans' disability pensions, which are likely to continue for another few decades. Yet. Once again, the real price has been paid by the Afghans. 
This 20-year war has claimed the lives of nearly 50,000 Afghan civilians and nearly 70,000 Afghan security forces, a majority during the last seven years. Add to it another 70,000 Afghan Taliban and the scale of the Afghan human loss becomes evident. This is the sunk cost. The real cost will be if yet another generation of Afghans is lost to conflict and violence as happened with the generation of the last decades of the 20th century. During the last 20 years, there have been gains too. In 2001, there were just 900,000 boys in school. Today, 8 million children attend school and one third are girls. Literacy is up from 12% in 2002 to 35% today. Life expectancy has gone up from 40 years to 63 years. Urbanization is 26%. 70% of the population watch television. From 200 miles of paved roads in 2002, today tarred roads cover 10,000 miles. Infant mortality rates are down from 20% by more than half. With a median age of 18 and a half years, a majority of Afghans today have grown up in a post-Taliban era, in a conservative but open society. However, these gains appear to be increasingly at risk today. Often described as a graveyard of empires, the reality is a little more complex. However, like all myths, it has a grain of truth. But myths persist and today the Taliban have revived it as their victory narrative over the sole superpower, the United States of America. But if we are looking for myths, let us look at the myth of being a superpower. After World War II, the US has not won a single war, except the Cold War, and that was won without firing a shot. The 1950-53 Korean War ended in an armistice that continues till date. In Vietnam, which was succeeded by the Paris Accords of 1973, it was an attempt to provide a decent interval for the US to withdraw. That decent interval was two years. Two years after the US exit, South Vietnam was overrun in 1975. The US quit Lebanon after the 1983 attack on the Marine barracks. It quit Somalia in 1994 following the downing of the Black Hawk. It withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989, but was pulled back in 2001. Just as it withdrew from Iraq in 2011, only to go back to battle the Islamic State in 2014. But as former Defense Secretary General James Mattis remarked, the US doesn't lose wars, it loses interest. However, the real tragedy with the US intervention in Afghanistan is that this enjoyed international support and except for the Taliban, also across the board domestic support in Afghanistan. Yet, such is the cumulative effect of a series of blunders committed by the US that today, continuing US presence had become part of the problem. The mistakes began in December of 2001. This was when Mullah Omar, the Taliban leader who had been deposed, reached out to Karzai, a Pashtun, to surrender. But the US was not in a mood to listen. The Taliban 
decided to move into sanctuaries across the border. The second mistake was when the US, playing the dominant role, created a new political system for an Afghan Republic, a presidential system much like the US system with enormous centralization of power, but unfortunately lacking the institutions of judiciary, Congress, Senate, civil society, media, etc. that ensures checks and balances. The US intervention in Iraq in 2003 then began to become a major distraction. It sucked up the political oxygen and bandwidth in Washington. By 2006, the Taliban had re-established, regrouped, and had reopened their funding channels. They now made a reappearance in Afghanistan. However, there was a US reluctance to accept this reality because most of the political oxygen in Washington was now occupied on Iraq. There was a growing ethnic factionalism in Afghanistan and rising levels of corruption. US responded by publicly expressing disenchantment with Karzai. Without realizing it, the US had moved from a counter-terrorism role into a counter-insurgency role. However, this had remained always under-resourced because according to the US counter-insurgency manuals, it recommends 20 soldiers for 1,000 population, implying that the US needed a troop strength of 600,000 for a population of 30 million or at least 400,000 if we consider that only two-thirds of the country was gripped by an insurgency. And this is when the insurgents do not have safe havens and sanctuaries. To Hamid Garzai's credit, he saw the writing on the wall when he protested about the night raids and warned the Americans to either take the fight to the safe havens and sanctuaries across the Durand line or make peace with the Taliban. He started calling the Taliban as his Afghan brothers. But this only soured his relations with the US further. The next blunder by the US was President Obama's announcement of the surge together with the date of withdrawal. This led to the Taliban coming up with the famous line, you have the watches, we have the time. The US then realized that the Afghan National Security Forces or the Afghan army was under-resourced and not adequately trained. It was then expanded to twice its size at that point in time. Special force regiments called the conducts were established. An attempt was made to build up a nascent Afghan air force. The next move came when President Trump decided to open direct talks with the Taliban in 2018. Pakistan played a long game, the first indication that their investment in providing safe haven and sanctuary to the Taliban was paying off, came a decade ago. In February 2011, after President Obama had announced his surge and also the fact that withdrawal would begin 18 months later, addressing the Asia society Hillary Clinton, then Secretary of State, reflected the policy shift when the preconditions for talks with the Taliban, renouncing violence and laying down arms, 
accepting the Afghan constitution and breaking ties with terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda were converted into outcomes of talks. So instead of preconditions, they had become outcomes. Taliban had come out of the shadows and were now seen as a political actor and not a terrorist group or even an insurgency. Pakistan's next goal was ensuring Taliban's legitimacy, something the regime had lacked in the 1990s because at that time only three countries, Pakistan, UAE and Saudi Arabia had recognized it. The process of legitimization began with the establishment of the Doha office in 2013, followed by the Pakistan-initiated quadrilateral coordination group talks, which involved the US, Afghanistan, China, and Pakistan, along with the Taliban. Other processes included the Kabul process, initiated by President Ashraf Ghani, the Heart of Asia process, initiated by Turkey, and the Moscow process. All through, the US limited its role to that of a facilitator for an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process. The breakthrough for Pakistan and the Taliban came when the Trump administration initiated direct talks with the Taliban, appointing Ambassador Zalmi Khalilzad as the Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation. He began by setting out four objectives. A ceasefire, cutting links with Al-Qaeda and Islamic State and other such terrorist groups, intra-Afghan peace talks, and finally, the withdrawal of all foreign forces, underlining that nothing is agreed till everything is agreed. The US accepted a time-bound, unconditional US withdrawal in return for a safe passage. Further, the Taliban also enhanced their legitimacy at the expense of the Kabul government by getting the US to have 5,000 Taliban insurgents in its custody released. President Biden's decision setting a deadline was a given. President Joe Biden had long believed that US needed to extricate itself from the unending counterinsurgency in Afghanistan and should henceforth limit its role to counterterrorism only. In the end, Taliban had more loyal and consistent backers in Pakistan and the ISI while the Kabul government steadily lost legitimacy because of its own incompetence and disunity and because its backers in the West eventually lost patience and interest and decided to cut their losses. During the last 60 years, Afghanistan has been a political laboratory. It has tried monarchy, a socialist republic, PDPA, with Taraki and Hafizullah Amin, a Soviet-backed communist regime under Babrak Karmal and Najibullah, jihadi warlordism, Taliban, and a Western-style democracy. What comes next? It depends on three factors. First, has there been a change in Taliban ideology? For over a decade, Pakistan has been telling the world that yes, there has been. And gradually, a few Western academics and former officials have also joined them. Frankly, there is little evidence of the change on the ground. One indication should be enough. The title of the agreement signed on 29th February 2020 with the United States in Doha is called the Agreement for Bringing Peace to Afghanistan 
between the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is not recognized by the US as a state and is known as the Taliban and the United States of America. So the title itself points to the fact that the two entities signing the agreement are those that do not recognize each other. Mind you, this agreement was then endorsed by consensus by the UN Security Council on 10th of March 2020, even though it was neither an Afghan-led nor an Afghan-owned agreement. A related question is, how unified and cohesive is the Taliban today? During Mullah Omar's time, it was clear that he called the shots. However, Mullah Omar had died in 2013, a fact that was only disclosed two years later in 2015, once the various peace processes had begun. His successor was Mullah Akhtar Mansur. However, Mullah Akhtar Mansur lasted just for a year or less. He was killed in a drone attack in Baluchistan in May of 2016. After Mullah Akhtar Mansur's killing, there was another shura and Mullah Haibatullah took over. This time he had two deputies, Mullah Yaqub, Mullah Omar's son, who belongs to the Hotaki tribe and also Sirajuddin Haqqani, a Zadran from Paktia, who is head of the Haqqani network. In addition to the Taliban, there are also other foreign elements today present in Afghanistan. There is the ETIM, the East Turkestan movement, consisting of Uyghurs, numbering perhaps 500 or so. Another grouping is the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, numbering perhaps another 500 or so. Then there are groups that have returned after fighting in Syria. The Khatiba Imam al-Bukhari. And there is, of course, the Islamic State Khorasan which is particularly active in the eastern provinces of Afghanistan and is reported to number about 2000. The Al-Qaeda had set up a separate franchise called the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, which still maintains close ties through, in fact, through marriage with some of the elements of the Taliban. The Pakistan-based Tehreek-e Taliban of Pakistan and other Pakistani-based groups like the Lashkar-e-Toiba, Jaish-e-Muhammad and jamaat ul lahrar number more than 5,000 and operate out of Afghanistan. The Taliban themselves also have ground commanders, the people who do the actual fighting. Notionally, they are supposed to report to the shadow governors appointed by the Taliban. But to a great extent, they are also on their own and operate according to their own wishes. A third group of the Taliban is the Doha group, headed by Mullah Brother, who is actually a Popolzai from Uruzgan. Mullah Brother was a co-founder of the Taliban when it was set up and is married to Mullah Omar's sister. All these different groups among the Taliban and associated with the Taliban are happy as far as a military strategy is being pursued because even the negotiators find that it improves their position at the bargaining table. However, what will happen when there is talk of power sharing or 
when there is talk of governance. My last visit to Afghanistan was in October 2019. I was invited for a um, conference in Herat. At that time, there was a uh, Taliban delegation also present. And I had uh, an occasion to have a conversation with the, with the Taliban finance minister, Agha Jan Mohtasim. I asked him what the Taliban were looking for. And at that time he said that, well, we will try to find some kind of a via media between the Islamic Emirate and the Republic of Afghanistan. How we do that, uh, he was not very clear. He said that, well, if we can have maybe 20 districts, maybe one province, we can at least establish a legitimate foothold and then we can continue talking. But clearly, Taliban has come a long way since. Even on 14th April, when President Joe Biden announced his deadline of 9-11 as the withdrawal date, Taliban controlled 76 districts out of a total of 421. Today, that total is close to 250. The second question is, what will be the longevity of the Kabul regime? They have spent the last few years sniping at each other. And that affects the morale of the Afghan security forces. It also impacts on the integrity of the chain of command. So far, the Taliban military strategy has been to focus on the rural areas and also on districts that surround provincial capitals so that they can make a move towards some of the provincial capitals at an appropriate time. In recent months, what they have done is they have also tried to take control of the border crossing points, possibly with a view to garnering the customs revenue. They have taken over Sher Bandar in Kunduz, which borders Tajikistan, Spin Boldak in Kandahar, the borders Pakistan, Islam Kala in Herat, it borders Iran, and Torgundi also in Herat, that borders Turkmenistan. The third question is what is Pakistan's long term strategy? Is it still seeking strategic depth or has it understood because Pakistan too has paid a heavy price for the radicalization that has taken place in its society. 25,000 civilians and nearly 9,000 soldiers have been killed as also about 25,000 militants. The economic loss according to Prime Minister Imran Khan, has been 125 billion. This is difficult to quantify, but my guess is this is also a counter to the accusations from US sources that they have received 34 billion as part of their cooperation in the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan. The problem with Pakistan is that they have always looked at Afghanistan through the India prism. This means that their relations with Afghanistan are also doomed to be hostile. That is one reason why they are so insistent on a diminished role for India in Afghanistan. Related to these questions is what is the influence of the external players? Of all the external players, even though the US is withdrawing, it probably still has the maximum influence. It has the military capability. 
it can launch military strikes. It doesn't have to be physically present there. Aerial attacks, missile strikes and the like. It has financial clout. After all, it has been paying more than $4 billion a year for the Afghan security forces. And most important, the US is also a kind of a legitimacy enabler. If the US chooses to impose sanctions on the Taliban regime for whatever human rights violations or whatever violence or whatever else they do, to that extent, it diminishes the Taliban legitimacy that they have tried so hard to build up. The second important player is Russia. Russia has enormous influence with the Central Asian countries, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, all three of whom share borders with Afghanistan. Russia also provides legitimacy. Recognition by Moscow provides legitimacy to the Taliban. And most important, the Russians as a permanent member of the UN Security Council can also be counted upon to block the US by exercising a veto if needed. We come to Iran. Iran as a neighboring country has significant influence. The Iranians speak Farsi. The Afghans speak Dari, which is very close to, which is almost the same as Farsi. However, this time, the Iranians have one more lever. This is the Fatimiyun Brigade. The Iranians had recruited the Shia Hazaras to go and fight in Syria. And it is believed that there are about 3,000 of these battle-hardened Hazaras who are now back in Afghanistan who can ensure that the Hazara Jat or the Hazara lands are protected in case the Taliban extremist Sunnis try to take over. Incidentally, the Fatimun Brigade was developed by General Ismail Khani, who is today the commander of the Al-Quds force after Qasim Soleimani was killed by the US. Then you come to Pakistan. Pakistan, of course, has the maximum influence. It provides landlocked Afghanistan with vital access. The Pashtun community, even though the border has been fenced, the Pashtun community still goes back and forth across the Durand line. And very importantly, China looks to Pakistan for guidance and advice on its Afghanistan policy. The Chinese have so far played a cautious game. They would like to involve Afghanistan in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, but only if they get assurances that their security problem with regard to the Uyghurs are taken care of. European Union and India are seen as more benign powers. India, in fact, is probably seen as even less intrusive than, say, compared to the European Union. More familiar with and tolerant in terms of local realities. Therefore, India is often seen as a natural and preferred development partner. A sentiment that I often hear in India today is, oh, what happens to the Indian investment in Afghanistan? After all, we have invested $3 billion. I don't really share this thinking. Investment implies a kind of a return on investment and that kind of thing. I think we should look at it as a fact that we have helped rebuild Afghanistan. We had shut down our embassy in 1996 when the Taliban entered Kabul. 
When we returned, after the Taliban had been ousted in 2001, we focused on three things. Humanitarian assistance, covering food supply, nutritious school child feeding programs, and deploying medical teams, conducting camps for artificial limbs and prosthetics, including the Jaipur foot. We focused on infrastructure development, highway connectivity, power transmission lines to Kabul. In fact, when I first went to Kabul in 2005, we used to have 18 hour blackouts out of 24 hours every day in Kabul. Today, these power transmission lines that India built bring power from the Central Asian countries to Kabul. We built the Parliament House, the Salma Dam, provided the TV uplink and downlink stations in each of the 34 provinces, restored the only pediatric hospital that India had originally built in 1972, set up cold storage units, and so on. Nearly 700 projects covering health centers, schools, public toilets, roads, and bridges. We also focused a lot on human resource development by providing short-term and long-term courses in India and setting up vocational training centers in Afghanistan. Today, there are more than 16,000 Afghan students pursuing higher education in India. Over 60,000 graduates, postgraduates, and other professionals have returned to Afghanistan after their education and training here. We have provided over 800 buses and minibuses, utility vehicles for municipalities and the army, ambulances, etc. None of the 34 provinces of Afghanistan has been left untouched. The result is that today, India does not need to seek a friendly government in Kabul. We only want a government that serves the interest of the Afghan people, because we are confident that such a government will find us a credible partner. This is because of the vision for Afghanistan that India has, a vision that is shared by most of the young Afghans, a vision of a stable, independent, peaceful, moderate, and inclusive country. India will remain engaged because that is what our shared history and geography dictates.